The PLP demands a public apology from Fort Charlotte MP Andre Rollins. The Prime Minister to address the Renward Wells controversy. Part 2 of NB12 School Violence Special Report. And new crime statistics show an increase in gun-related deaths. We've got those stories and more coming up tonight. I'm Dana Smith and NB12 starts right now. Copy news tonight after publicly slamming Prime Minister Perry Christie and the leadership of the Progressive Liberal Party embattled Fort Charlotte MP Dr. Andre Rollins will now have to publicly apologize for his inflammatory comments. The former gaming board chairman was in the hot seat last night as the PLP's National General Counsel met to discuss Rollins' fate. However, party chairman Bradley Roberts says time will tell if Rollins chooses to apologize. Bonnie Toot reports. The PLP's National General Counsel has demanded that Fort Charlotte MP Dr. Andre Rollins apologize in the House of Assembly if he wants to mend fences with his party following his scathing attacks on Prime Minister Perry Christie. Speaking with reporters following last night's closed meeting, PLP Chairman Bradley Roberts says he appointed a four-person committee from the NGC to decide what sanctions, if any, Rollins should face for his controversial comments. He was called upon to um, explain himself, etc., etc., which he did, and uh, he uh, indicated uh, uh, in a form, his apology, etc., etc., and so forth. The matter has been referred to a committee of four persons who will make their recommendation. Robert says there is no timeline for Rollins to publicly apologize, but the committee will report to the general counsel next month. Rollins has been one of his party's most vocal critics in recent months, declaring that the country needs new leadership and most recently threatening to name names if fellow MP Renward Wells is fired for signing a letter of intent without cabinet approval. Our people spoke very, very directly and forcefully and uh, uh, our people were deeply concerned and hurt over the attack of the member of parliament uh, uh, against the prime minister and his party. And they expressed themselves very forthrightly with regard to that. And he accepted their response? Oh, yes. He had no other choice but to accept it. Would we you are a democracy. He can say what he wants to say, and our people say what they want to say. Prime Minister Christie, Deputy Prime Minister Davis, numerous cabinet ministers and scores of stalwart councillors attended the hours-long meeting at PLP headquarters on Farrington Road. Rollins appeared to be in a good mood as he left last night's meeting, but declined to speak with reporters. So the word is that you said that you uh, do not regret what you said in the House of Assembly. I want you to speak to the Prime Minister on that. Speak to the Chairman. Okay. Speak to the Chairman and Prime Minister on that. Huh? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Davis wasn't in a very talkative mood either. I think it went well. It was, it was a closed meeting and things that happen between closed doors stays between behind closed doors. Okay. Now, I, was, I, I was satisfied with it. Prime Minister Christie, who spoke at length in the meeting, gave his take on the situation, particularly Rollins' suggestion that others should be fired if Wells gets the boot over the letter of intent. I thought he was very explicit in saying he did not mean it. He had no evidence of it. He did not mean to say it. I thought it was very clear on that. Um, but very, very clear to me that when you are in a political organization, you have to be seen to be a part of the political organization. The Prime Minister says Rollins was brought into the PLP because he had confidence in the Fort Charlotte MP. He says he is still very concerned by the former gaming board chairman's comments, but he doesn't take it personally. For me, I'm too advanced and matured a politician to take things personally because I have the responsibility of leading the organization and the position I have always taken is that I cannot be distracted. We are on the edge of some big things for the Bahamas. Christie says he viewed the meeting as a teachable moment and would let the committee decide where to go from here. That committee will be chaired by former Fort Charlotte MP Valentine Grimes. The committee of myself, Tom Baston, 
Uh, Robin Lyons and the former president of the Young Liberals is a good team to work with, and I think we'll be fair. Uh, the important thing, is, thing at the end of the day is that the party become stronger as a result of it. Reporting for NB12, I'm Vonik Toot. Well, it seems Rollins' fate was not the only matter on the agenda last night. Prime Minister Christie told reporters the Deputy Prime Minister has briefed him on the matter involving Parliamentary Secretary Renward Wells, who signed a letter of intent for a $600 million waste-to-energy plant without Cabinet approval. Christie said he will soon address the matter in the House of Assembly, and so will Wells. I had said to Renwood Wells, I'm going to let you speak to the nation. The, the leader of the opposition has asked for a committee um, in the House of Assemblies on the agenda. And before we break, I'm going to have you speak to that, and I'll speak to it. Um, of course, with, with new interventions now being made about who's done what and who's done what, it, it changes the whole situation. And I've just been receiving a briefing from the Deputy Prime Minister and who was then acting in my place as to what took place, um, the Progressive Liberal Party in itself. The opposition has called for Wells to be fired, but government has yet to make a decision on his future. Well, FNM Chairman Darren Cash criticized the governing party today for demanding a public apology from Andre Rollins. Cash said Rollins should not be forced to apologize, and the Prime Minister should use this opportunity to take responsibility and demonstrate true leadership. Simone Davis has that angle. Cash said he finds it interesting that Rawlins was asked to publicly apologize when the prime minister has yet to apologize to the Bahamian people. The FNM chairman told reporters today he believes that Rawlins's comments on the leadership of the PLP were genuine and because of that he has done damage to the governing party. It is rather interesting that the government or the political organization that Perry Christie leads would find it necessary to have Andre Rawlins apologize publicly for hurting the prime minister's feelings. Yet, they do not see the necessity or wisdom in having the prime minister apologize to the Bahamian people, firstly for leading the cause against the 2002 referendum. The statements that have been made by Mr. Rollins are, um, are genuine, that they are not the result of coordinated action on the part of the PLP. Cash also addressed the controversy surrounding Ministry of Works Parliamentary Secretary Renwood Wells, who signed a letter of intent for a $600 million waste-to-energy plant without cabinet approval. In reference to the LOI incident, Cash said he doesn't think that Wells should be left to explain. He said that's Christie's responsibility. Mr. Wells should not be the person who reports to the Bahamian people. It ought to be Prime Minister Christie. It is his government. Mr. Wells works for him. It is he who ordered an investigation. It is he who promised to the Bahamian people that he would answer. And so now it is he who must look into the camera and report to the Bahamian people. It is not acceptable for the Prime Minister to shirk his responsibilities and place Renwood Wells as the person who must account. Cash added that the Renwood Wells situation provides an opportunity for the Prime Minister to step up and demonstrate true leadership. He said the fact that Christie hasn't been speaking out much about the situation is an obscene act of political cowardice at a time when the country needs a strong leader. In other words, he needs to man up and account to the Bahamian people for the things that have been happening in his government. Nothing else will be acceptable. Reporting for NB12, I'm Simone Davis. In other news, school violence continues to be a hot-button issue as the Ministry of Education and the Teachers Union tell different stories about what's happening on public school campuses. The videos that continue to surface online showing students embroiled in fights tell an all-too-real story of what's really going on. Tonight, Shanique Miller takes a look at the cell phone policy and the issue of school policing. It's been a firestorm in the 72 hours since NB12 exposed the level of violence in public schools. The Minister of Education attacked the report, questioning the validity of it. But the response to the NB12 newsroom tells a different story. People appearing to be teachers and some support staff reached out to us to express their gratitude that the issue has finally come to light. Here's some of what they had to say. 
I am so pleased that you stood strong on behalf of the teachers like myself. Very proud of you. Keep up the responsible journalism. Your story was cute as it didn't tell what's really going on. It's the result of BUT President Belinda Wilson's claims that teachers are concerned about the level of violence they're faced with in the classroom and on campus. She said oftentimes a violent attack or outburst affects the entire school day. You may have an a, a incident where um, someone says, okay, there is a, an incident on the campus where someone was injured seriously. There may have even been a weapon. So that means then school has to, you, you have to lock down. You have to lock down and you have to use all the resources that are available to you on the campus to try and, first of all, ascertain and investigate and find out what's going on. Mm -hmm. And then that can actually cause the entire school day to be lost. The question of why these incidents are now only coming to light and why principals weren't speaking out was put to Wilson. I would think that um, principals are refusing to reach out and speak out because they are protecting their positions. And we have a lot of um, principals and even other administrators who aspire to be promoted. And so no one wants to be seen as, okay, the troublemaker, quote unquote, or the person who is squealing or the person who's really facing the problems head on and being prepared to speak on the issues honestly. Another sticky issue facing the public school system is the cell phone policy implemented in 2009-2010. Are students allowed to have them during school hours? Cell phone videos showing students fighting in classrooms around the campus and after school outside the campus make the rounds on social media almost on a weekly basis. Wilson insists teachers were never given a clear blueprint of how the policy should work. It's a failed policy. It's not working. I think more cell phones are in schools now than when they um, drafted the policy and I don't think anyone is following a cell phone policy. Now when we visited the Ministry of Education Security Division, Goth Johnson produced hundreds of cell phones insisting the policy was in effect. I asked him were teachers aware of the protocol. School policy, anyone who is disrupting a class like that, the teacher will confiscate that, that phone. As a matter of fact, we have a, a box here with phones that has been confiscated. And um, we have had incidents in the past where Teachers have taken phones or other items from students who were disrupting classes and secure them. And the children came back and break open the school to, re to, to retrieve their property. So we now um, take possession of these things and um, keep them for final disposition or disposal. The debate on whether police are on school campuses continues the union questions the status of the program. It would have been shortly after the election. So I would call that one of the um, governments or the ministries, I call them photo opportunities, so that they could say to the public, this is what we're doing. However, once the, the camera turns off and the microphones are turned off, there is no follow-up. There is no true partnership. There is no real work being done on a day-to-day -day basis. The school policing program is not as it was formed to be. Um, initially, when the program was formed, um, it was formed to really police the school. Johnson is working on increasing school security. He says he's hoping to have CCTV installed on middle and high school campuses in the coming year. Reporting for NB12, I'm Shanique Miller.